World Health Organization warns of COVID 2.0, saying that this pandemic isn't necessarily the big one. It begs the question, are masks and lockdowns a permanent part of our future? I'm going to explain this to you and try to answer that question in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go right to the internet and explore exactly what the WHO is talking about, the World Health Organization, and how they see 2021 and potentially our future. This is from a recent Zero Hedge article. The World Health Organization has warned that a worse pandemic than COVID could be around the corner and that what we've seen so far in 2020 isn't necessarily the big one. They go on to say, with global lockdowns, international stripping of freedoms, and the decimation of small businesses and the economy as a whole, it is difficult to imagine how it could get any worse. I definitely agree. Yet, the WHO is predicting that could very well be the case. The head of the World Health Organization Emergencies Program, Dr. Mike Ryan, said during a media briefing, that this pandemic is very severe, it has affected every corner of the planet, but it isn't necessarily the big one. He says, we live in an increasingly complex global society. These threats will continue. Despite the vaccine, the virus is set to become endemic and will never go away. So if you're like me, you're getting the vibe that they're implying that masks and lockdowns could be a permanent part of our future. So you may be asking yourself, what about these vaccines that they're rolling about? They address it right here. WHO chief scientist, Dr. Soima Swaminathan, said that the rollout of the vaccine does not mean social distancing or mask wearing can go away. The direct quote is, I don't believe we have the evidence on any of the vaccines to be confident that it's going to prevent people from actually getting the infection and therefore being able to pass it on. So I would ask the question, then why are we doing the vaccine? (laughs) I guess the vaccine makes it so you can't get sick from the illness, but that's a whole other topic, I guess. The comments come after Swaminathan warned that the restrictive lockdown measures won't let up until the end of 2021, when population immunity or herd immunity is achieved. So what they're saying is the masks and lockdowns will be with us for at least the next year till the end of 2021. But what we're dealing with now isn't the big pandemic. That will be coming in the future. I'd also like to add that since 2003, we've had SARS, avian, swine, MERS, Ebola, H1N1, Zika, Ebola again, (laughs) and now the Cervasa sickness or the coronavirus. So should we assume that over the next 20 years, we'll have a similar amount of viruses to deal with? And then you've got to ask the question, How will the government handle these things in the future? Now they've set a precedence to where their standard operating procedure is to lock down the entire economy until they find out how severe the virus actually is. Step number two. Now let's go over the data and the charts so we can determine the efficacy of mask mandates and lockdowns Then in step number three, we can put all the pieces of the puzzle together to figure out if periodically to varying degrees, we'll have to live with mask mandates and lockdowns forever. Let's start by looking at some charts of states and countries, and maybe in some counties that instituted mask mandates to see if there's any correlation between when they instituted the mandate and the rate of cases or deaths. We'll start with Oregon, 
they instituted a statewide mask mandate July 1st. And this is daily new cases per 1 million. And this is basically a moving average that smooths everything out. So they instituted this July 1st. And as you can see, the cases continue to increase and then go down at the end of the summer. Then they increase dramatically when fall really starts to kick in in October. But keep in mind, the mask mandate is still in effect. We go down to Nevada, and again, there's no correlation whatsoever. Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico follow a very similar trajectory as far as daily new cases per 1 million. But the interesting thing is they instituted a mask mandate at different times, New Mexico, May 16th, Colorado, July 17th, and Utah, November 9th. And here's a chart of the UK, France, Spain, Italy, versus Sweden. And this is daily new deaths plus mask compliance, not just mandatory mask. And this is as of December 1st. So Italy had the highest daily new deaths, but also had the highest mask usage, where Sweden had the lowest mask usage at 7.7%, but also had the lowest new daily deaths. Here's New York. And just by the way, I've skipped through a lot of charts that really show the exact same thing where there's no correlation whatsoever. So I'll put a link to this website in the description below the video so you can check this out yourself. But going back to New York, they really had a problem at the beginning of the Cervasa sickness. We all know that. They instituted the statewide mask mandate April 17th. And this really seemed to have brought the cases down dramatically. In fact, July 22nd, Fauci himself came out and said New York did it correctly. Their cases plateaued, but then as winter came on or fall, their cases once again skyrocketed while they were quote unquote doing it correctly. <laughs> and you may be saying to yourself, George, well, maybe some states the people are obeying the rules and some states they aren't. So if we just made the regulations more draconian, then we would see the actual mandates match up with a suppression or a decrease in the number of cases. Although that wasn't true in Europe, maybe that would be true in the United States. But then we bring up a state like Connecticut that instituted inside mask mandates April 20th. That seemed to work a little bit for a while. And again, what you'll notice is it seems to be very seasonal. Shocking. Just like the Spanish flu, where it comes in waves. The first wave in the spring, then it goes down in the summer goes back up in the winter. It's just what we've seen, but for some reason, people see the data and they get shocked by it. But again, that's a separate video <laughs> or a separate rabbit hole. So it plateaued during the summer, it went down, decreased significantly during the summer. But then in August 15th, they expanded the mandate and they created an outside mask mandate. And then they got really draconian and created fines for not wearing masks. So people really were most likely obeying the rules then, right around the end of September. But what happens as we go into fall with an inside mask mandate, an outside mask mandate, and fines for not wearing masks, the cases still spike dramatically. It's almost like the virus is going to virus. <laughs> to use a quote from Tom Woods. We pull up Los Angeles County. It's the same thing here. Inside mask mandate, April 10th. Outside May 14th. The cases continue to go up. And then they go down at the end of the summer. And then they really start to spike in the fall. They institute curfews. They close outdoor dining. But the cases continue to skyrocket. So this isn't about debating whether masks themselves are effective. 
This is just to show that the mask mandates when the government comes in and forces or tries to force people to wear masks. There's no correlation whatsoever between the regulation when it's instituted and the number of cases. Now let's move on to lockdowns themselves. For this, we're going to go straight to the CDC's own website where they have this pretty cool map, this interactive map where you can see the number of cases the for the last seven days or since January 21st, 2020. And what I'll do is compare California with Florida because we know California has pretty much been the most draconian with maybe the exception of New York. And Florida has been the most liberal, the most laissez-faire. So starting with cases over the last seven days, California has really had it bad. They're pretty much the worst. Dark blue color would imply 72 to 95 per 100,000 as far as the cases. Where Florida, which is pretty much entirely open, has seen the case count at 43 to 53 per 100,000. So you've got California that's on complete lockdown mode, curfews, mandatory masks. They have a higher case rate per 100,000 than Florida, which is almost entirely open. But I know going back just seven days doesn't tell the whole story. So let's go back to January 21st of 2020 and see if there's a difference. So going back that far, the cases per 100,000 in California 5,456. In Florida, 5,859. <laughs> so almost identical, but California turned into a police state where Florida remained relatively free. Just like with the masks, we don't see a strong correlation with lockdowns and the case rate. So you have to ask the question, how effective or not effective are these lockdowns? And to really put things into perspective, let's go to an article from Nature. And shockingly enough, this statistic is very hard to find. The data is all over the place and very little of it that I could find on the Internet after doing about two hours of research was recent. So this is pretty much the most recent that I could find. And unfortunately, it's not the United States. This, I believe, is in, uh, from a Nature article at the end of August, beginning of September. But we look at basically the case fatality rate from Geneva, England, and Spain for different age groups. And as we know, the higher the age bracket, the more dangerous the virus actually is. But to what degree, I think, is the question we have to ask. So... In Geneva, 65 and older, 5.6% fatality rate. And when you get under 65, it's down to almost nothing, something very similar to the flu, actually. And in England, a little bit different metric, different age group, for 75 and older, 11.6, 65 to 74, 3.1. And then it drops dramatically again. And in Spain, 80 and over, 7.2. 70 to 79, 3.4. And if you've never been to these areas, I have. And let me tell you the big difference. When you walk off the train or the airplane in Geneva, everybody's skinny. When you get off the train or the plane in England, everybody is fat. And I think what you can see in the countries where people are the most overweight, usually they have a pretty big problem with the virus, especially at these older age groups. But we can kind of combine all of these numbers to really get our heads around how dangerous this really is. And as it turns out, it is dangerous for people over the age of, call it 65. For people under the age of maybe 55, not so much. And in some areas, in some countries, the numbers are pretty similar to the flu. Although here in the United States, the numbers are higher than the flu for all age groups. 
But when I say higher, again, you've got to put things into perspective. Higher for a 20-year-old means the difference between 0 0.002 and 0 0.02. So it's not like it's the difference between 0 0.002 and 20%. We're talking about a rounding error until you get up into these higher age groups. And one more thing I'd like to point out, that as we get more familiar with the virus and the treatments, the case fatality rate overall has been decreasing. So we can safely say that how well mask mandates and lockdowns work is inconclusive at best. But I'm not here to say that if you believe one thing or the other, that you're right or wrong. I want to be very clear. I'm just here to present the facts, the data, and let you come to your own conclusion. Step number three. We now know what the World Health Organization and most likely the global elites plans are for 2021 and beyond. We went over a lot of the data. Now we need to do a cost benefit analysis to put all the pieces of the puzzle together to determine if masks and lockdowns are gonna be a permanent part of our future. To start, let's check out the costs for these regulations and go right back to the internet. The first cost is the fact that we are giving government more and more control over our personal lives. Therefore, we are losing more and more of our personal freedoms and liberties. As an example of this, let's go back to 9-11 and look at the Patriot Act. We're at the ACLU's website, so not exactly a right-leaning group, <laughs> to say the least. But here's their overview of what happened with the Patriot Act. Hastily passed 45 days after 9-11 in the name of national security, the Patriot Act was the first of many changes to surveillance laws that made it easier for governments to spy on ordinary Americans by expanding the authority to monitor phone and email communications, collect bank and credit reporting records, and track the activity of innocent Americans on the internet. While most Americans think it was created to catch terrorists, the Patriot Act actually turns regular citizens into suspects. And then they've got this pretty cool infographic that goes over some of the more egregious things that the government has done in the name of the Patriot Act. Now, keep in mind, this only was updated maybe 2011. Since then, it's gotten far, far worse when you include things like FATCA, which is overseas banking regulation. Again, completely separate video, but it's a serious encroachment on personal liberty and freedom. So it starts in 2003 with the government issuing these national security letters, NSLs. They're issued by FBI agents without a judge's approval to obtain personal information like phone records, computer records, banking history, credit history. Between 2003 and 2006 alone, there were over 190,000 of these issued. And only one, one out of almost 200,000 led to a terror-related conviction. This is why I always say you have to look at the actual results of a government program and not the intentions. Because the results and the intentions usually are the complete opposite. And to add insult to injury, not only are they invading your privacy, but the Patriot Act does not require the information obtained by these NSLs to be destroyed. So it's there forever. Your info is saved on their servers, the NSA, the FBI. And again, it's there forever. It never gets deleted. At least 34,000 law enforcement and intelligence agents have access to phone records collected through these NSLs. Another example of how over the top this can be, in response to just nine NSLs, 11,100 Americans' telephone account records were turned over to the FBI. The Patriot Act prohibits Americans who receive these NSLs from telling anyone. 
So it's basically a gag order, which, oh, by the way, is unconstitutional and has been proven in several legal cases. Between 2003 and 2005, the FBI made 53 reported criminal referrals to prosecutors as a result of 143,000 NSLs. The 192 that we talked about before was including 2006. So from 2003 to 2005, 17 of these were for money laundering, 17 immigration, 19 fraud, and zero for terrorism. (laughs) So the one terrorism claim came in 2006. The Patriot Act also allows the government to do sneak and peek searches. The Patriot Act allows federal government enforcement agencies to delay giving notice when they conduct secret searches of Americans' homes and offices, a fundamental change to the Fourth Amendment, privacy protection, and search warrants. I would argue it's just flat out unconstitutional, and we can leave it at that. And here, once again, the results of a law are completely the opposite of what the stated intentions are or how it's sold to the general public. This is a law that is supposed to protect us from terrorism, yet 76% of these sneak and peaks in 2010 were drug-related, 24% other, and less than 1% were related to terrorism. So right about now, I'm sure your friend and family member Fred is saying, George, that's not even close to the same thing as masks or lockdowns. Because the Patriot Act was a permanent law. These things are just temporary. And plus, the masks and the lockdowns are for our personal safety. They're just like seatbelt laws for cars or helmet laws for motorcycles. Unfortunately, that's not a great argument with me because I don't think there should be seatbelt laws nor do I think there should be helmet laws (laughs) for the exact same reason. It's giving government too much control over our personal lives, just like the Patriot Act. And I'd also like to remind your friend and family member Fred of the famous quote from one of my favorites. (laughs) That's right, Milton Friedman, who said, nothing is so permanent as a temporary government program. Definitely true with the Patriot Act, and I think it'll be true today with whatever power the government grabs away from you and I, the individual, as a result of the Cervasa sickness. Okay, moving on. Let's go to some of the problems caused by the lockdowns. We know the benefits or what the benefits are perceived to be, saving lives. Okay, that's great. But what are the costs? So first, we've got 100 to 2,000 TB deaths worldwide over the next five years. And there are links to all of these statements. 150 million globally added to the extreme poor as a result of lockdowns. The level of hunger in the United States almost tripled between 2019 and August of 2020. Depression also increases significantly. 25% of 18 to 24-year-olds considered suicide in June in the United States. 11% of all adults, with 40% of all adults reporting mental health or substance abuse problems. This is according to the CDC. In some counties or some cities like DuPage, 22.7% increase in actual suicides. That is extremely tragic. Huge increases of death from home. And that's because people aren't going into the hospital because of COVID. So they're not getting the treatment they need. This isn't because the hospitals are overwhelmed. It's because they're choosing not to go to the hospital or the hospital isn't letting them in because they're worried about them either contracting or spreading the Cervasa sickness. CDC also reports 300,000 excess all-cause deaths One third of these, so 100,000 of those deaths from lockdown, not from COVID. 35% of missed routine cancer screenings, 43% missed medical appointments. And again, this isn't because the hospitals are overwhelmed. Most likely it's because they just shut down that branch because they were worried 
about spreading the virus. And I want to point out that I'm skipping over a lot of the costs and a lot of the links here. We'll put a link to this entire blog post in the description below. So if you want to look at all of the negative effects outlined in this article, you can do so. And now we move on to something that I'm more familiar with, and that's economics. 60% of U.S. businesses that closed due to the cerveza sickness will not reopen. 60%. That is a staggering number. 4,400 Chicago area businesses alone have closed during the pandemic, and 2,400 say they'll never reopen. That's just in one city. Think of how bad it is across the United States and across the globe because of these lockdowns. U.S. GDP drops 32.9%, the worst ever. And you may be saying to yourself, okay, George, well, it's up substantially since then. That's right, because of stimulus checks and the government spending money, $5 trillion deficit just this year to try to prop up GDP. So although GDP, the headline number, might only be down by 6 or 7%, you've got to realize without that government spending, basically mortgaging our children's future, the GDP would be down further than it was during the Great Depression. And it's a direct result of the lockdowns. So let's go back to a chart of the case fatality rate. I just tried to combine some of those numbers we saw from step number two into this one chart just to make it easier to see. Starts at zero years, goes all the way to 80 years old plus. On the left, we go from 1% up to 7%. This blue line represents the Cervasa sickness as it is right now, kind of the average of those charts we saw. The red line is basically the flu, and these are just rough numbers. So the perceived benefit of lockdowns and mandatory masks is that this line would come down, become closer to the flu. But these benefits, as we saw, are inconclusive. We don't really know if these lockdowns or if these additional regulations work. In fact, the data would suggest they don't work at all and there is no correlation. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that masks themselves don't work. I'm saying that the data shows mandatory mask regulations don't work. And if you think masks work, that's great. There's a lot of evidence out there that suggests they do. But you have to ask the question, they work at doing what? You see, most of the studies I have read shows that they work at reducing the spread of XYZ virus if the individual is coughing. They have to be coughing in order for the mask to work. If they're just talking, or to take it to the next step, if they're just breathing, then they really don't do much at all. And again, these are just the studies I've read. It's not to say that I'm right or wrong on the topic. But then we have to ask, if they do work, they work to what degree, right? If it goes from 1% to 0.8%, we could say that, yeah, they work, but not enough to move the needle. It's not like we're saying it goes from a 50% chance of spreading down to a 1%. So when you're going through those surveys or when you're going through the research, make sure that you're asking those questions. So going back to the specific cost benefit analysis, we know the benefit is really up in the air. It's inconclusive, but the costs are more government power and less personal freedom. Hundreds of thousands of additional deaths just in the United States. That does not include what has happened worldwide because of the lockdowns. More mental issues, higher rate of drug and alcohol abuse, economic devastation. This cannot be disputed at all. And more and more poverty. The next thing we have to ask ourselves 
is how many individuals or businesses would have taken the exact same action with no regulation in place whatsoever. <laughs> now, it's not 0% and it's not 100%. It's somewhere on a spectrum. But when we're trying to determine the benefit of an actual regulation, how far it would take this blue line down to this red line, we have to determine that getting here in the first place has been a result of some people taking action on their own. Florida would be a good example of this. Although it's wide open, you still see some businesses that require a mask when you go inside. And you see some people that are walking around with a mask when they're outdoors. It's their personal choice. So I would estimate that 70% of the people would choose to take action on their own with no lockdowns whatsoever. So the main takeaway is there is no real definitive upside, but there is an extreme defined downside that we saw when we went over the list of the costs. So wouldn't it make more sense if we got the government out of the picture, just gave people the data and let them make their own decisions? We just suggest that these individuals in the high-risk group take action on their own, wear an N95 mask if they so choose, and don't go in public spaces. Not many of these individuals who are in a very low-risk group actually live at home with their 80-year-old parents or grandparents. If we got the government, which is turning into a police state, out of the picture, the benefit would most likely be very close to the same, but we would have none of the defined costs. And you may be asking yourself right about now, okay, George, I get what you're saying. Whether I like it or I don't, I get it. But how does that help me determine whether or not these regulations are gonna be a permanent part of my future? So let me try to connect the dots. I think we have to understand the mentality of the society we live in today. And that's a society that prioritizes safety and not feeling any pain above anything else. In fact, I would argue that that's priority one through 10, maybe one through 100. <laughs> Personal freedom and liberty is an afterthought. And that's something we can only consider after we know that we're 100% safe and we will never feel any short-term pain. And we see this playing out in states like California, but we also see it playing out economically across our entire country. Is there any difference between the lockdowns or the mandatory masks and quantitative easing. It's the exact same thing. It's meant to make sure that we as a society are safe and don't feel any pain. One is health safety, the other is economic safety. And regardless of what liberties and freedom we have to sacrifice, or regardless of how much we mortgage our children's future and our grandchildren's future, in the case of quantitative easing, it doesn't matter as long as we're safe and we don't feel any pain in the short term. I also think that our political views have become a religion. And that's not just with the people who disagree with me. I think that's the people who agree with me as well. There's a lot of different reasons for that. But because this is really a religion for people, they're just going to disagree with the other side just to disagree, regardless of how many facts or data points or charts there are. So for a lot of people who are watching this video, they're going to see everything I went over in step number two and here in step number three, and they're going to completely ignore it. They just don't care. Regardless of what the data says, regardless of what the charts say, they're still going to believe that if we just lock down harder, or if we just had more severe penalties for not wearing masks, all our problems would be solved.
And then we have to consider the motivation of your typical politician. <laughs> I am very hard on politicians, as you guys know in my video. But I think at the end of the day, they're really prostitutes for votes. They're going to do whatever they need to do. They have no moral backbone. They're going to do whatever they think they need to do to get the vote. So if they think lockdowns over the next 20 years are going to get them votes, that's exactly what they're going to do. If they think that keeping businesses open and ignoring any of these future viruses that come our way are going to get them votes, then that is what they're going to do. It's just like my buddy Art Berman says, we get the politicians we deserve. So it goes back to how fanatical our society is going to be when it comes to safety and not feeling any pain. Which brings me to a quote which I think really helps us get our mind around everything we've talked about in this video and what the future holds. Editor, go ahead and throw up the quote. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. So I think it's a matter of how fast we get to the hard times that will produce the next generation of strong men and women. In other words, I think we're going to have these masks and lockdowns until we hit the next round of hard times. And what does that mean? Well, you guys know me. I'm going to put it into economic terms. I think we're going to continue to have these regulations because people believe that we can lock the entire economy down and just print up stimulus checks and no one has to go back to work and there's no downside. But you guys know, as well as I do, eventually we will get the pain of inflation. So it's kind of a race in my mind. It's the pain of inflation going up and the pain or lack of perception of safety. So at a certain point, safety is here and the pain from the inflation is going to exceed the pain from the loss of safety. So when we start getting extremely high rates of consumer price inflation, so we can't print more money, more stimulus checks to go ahead and lock down the economy without exacerbating the inflation problem, that's when society at large says time out. No more lockdowns, no more money printing, because we cannot handle the extreme pain that we are feeling from consumer price inflation. So that extreme price inflation or stagflation like we saw in the 1970s is what creates the hard times which creates the next generation of strong men and strong women that will say no to mandatory masks and no to government lockdowns. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.